has a heart attack, because of course that means no dinner for a whole week or something. You know? Do you think the law is punishing Travis and George equally? Same violation. But this guy has lots of money. He couldn't care less about it. While this guy is trying to survive working 12 hours a day at McDonald's. Obviously, there is not an equal amount of suffering that's being inflicted on both, right? So the law is not being fair on that count, meaning it's not being just on that count. Now, on some, in some European countries, <clears throat> they have proportional penalties. So if you get a, a ticket, a traffic ticket or a parking ticket, they will look into your tax records, your income tax and all that, and they'll see how much you make, and, and then they will give you a proportional ticket. So let's say this time Travis gets an $800 ticket and, and um, George gets a, uh, say, a $20 ticket. But you know what? Travis is that kind of guy. He's just going to look at the ticket and say, oh, 800 Dad isn't going to be very happy this time, but hey, I'm just going to have a beer and forget about this. And he just forgets about it. Right? While George is a perfectionist, and he knows that ticket was unfair because you couldn't see the sign. It was hidden behind some tree. And they always place the signs behind those trees so you can't see them. And this is unfair. And he's going to have a second heart attack. And it doesn't matter. He's not going to pay this even if this is the last thing he does in his life. Two different personality types. Is the penalty inflicting the same amount of suffering on both of them? No. Is there anything the law can do about that? So the law is bound to be unjust, immoral to a certain degree, in a way which cannot be avoided. And maybe despite that fact, as Thoreau himself argues, we have an overarching moral obligation to obey those low immorality laws for the sake of social order, despite the fact that they may not be fully moral. Okay? All right, well, this is what I wanted to say, and just to remind you that you need to remember the reasons, the kinds of evidence we offer in this class um, for making this sharp distinction between morality and the law, how they're not one and the same thing, Although sometimes they can be, they can, co they can coincide. Sometimes the moral thing may also be the legal thing, and vice versa. But not always. Okay. Now let me um, um, move on to uh, talk about some um, concepts which are important in ethical theory and that we need to to remember and to work with. Uh, one is the concept of virtue. What do we mean by virtue? George, are you a virtuous man? Yes, of course you are. Uh, the word virtue comes from Latin ver, that's the, the root, V-I-R. If I could remember where I left the uh, I can't find the, okay, here it is. Uh, virtue, okay. In Latin, ver means man. Virtue literally means manliness. So being virtuous means being manly. And this really says a lot about the association between manliness, between um, being a man and being good versus being a woman and being weak. Right? And we'll say a lot more about this when it comes to uh, our discussion of radical feminism. But uh, for now, just to know the origin of the word. Uh, even if down to the 19th century, you see texts, and we will see that when we discuss Thoreau's book, in which the way to say that someone is good is to say they're, they're, they're men, they're true men. He's a real man. That means it has nothing to do with being very masculine or very macho or anything like that. It just means he's a true moral person, a true respectable person, someone who's uh, you know, morally firm and, and someone you can rely on, a real man, a true man. So, I mean, the best thing for a woman would be to be a, a manly woman. Uh, I, I, know, I think you, you guys would like manly women, but that's the idea, okay? 
There are two concepts of virtue that have gone hand in hand in the Western tradition. One is the Greek Aristotelian, and the other one the Christian or Judeo-Christian concept of virtue. Let me start with the Greek Aristotelian concept of virtue. Now, for Aristotle, um, virtue, the, the Greek word had a different meaning from the, the Latin-based um, word in English, virtue. Arete was the, the, the word that was used in Greek. Arete, which really means excellence. It's, it's a different, different notion, a different understanding, okay? Virtue in this Latin Christianized um, um, understanding has to do with manliness which in manliness, the original association uh, of, of being a man with being good or superior has to do with being resistant or hard, even in a sexual sense. So and what makes a man a man is to be hard in his muscles, sexually with the association also of an erection, and also morally speaking, resistant to temptation. That's the good thing. That's being manly, that's being virtuous. In the Western tradition, we'll see that women are understood as not being so virtuous because they give up easily to temptation and they have to be under the control of men. Think of Eve, how, how she is the, one, the first one to, to sin in the, in the book of Genesis in the Bible, and she induces uh, Adam to sin as well. So that's the association with the word virtue, the original association. Arete, however, has to do with being good at something excellence at something. Right? <clears throat> um, so let me start with the Greek concept of virtue. Um, I'm sure you've heard the word virtuoso, by the way. Virtuoso, virtuoso is a word we apply to someone who is really good at something, usually at um, playing a musical instrument, piano or violin. We say it's a virtuoso. It just means it's virtuous. Um, for uh, Aristotle, 4th century BCE, the 300s BCE, uh, virtue uh, is defined as the mean in between two extremes. That is moderation. So you don't need too much or too little because the one thing is excess and the other side is another extreme which is not good. But you eat the right amount. You don't drink too much or too little, you drink the right amount. You don't give too much money to the poor or too little but what is reasonable. So that's the very concept of virtue. How do you achieve virtue? Well, through practice. Virtue is a habit. Through repetition, practice, and discipline. So the first time that you um, practice generosity by giving a certain amount to a charity, it will hurt. It will kind of hurt, OK? Um, you know. And, but then, when you get used to giving 30 or $40 or whatever you decide to give to a charity every single month, after a few months, or a one year, or whatever it takes, it won't hurt anymore. You won't feel any pain. It'll be part of your regular budget. And so at that point, Aristotle says, you have shaped yourself as a virtuous person. You are a virtuous person already. You are a virtuous person, but it comes out naturally. Well, Aristotle also um, acknowledged the existence of what he called techne, technical virtues. So you can be a virtuous person, morally speaking, but you can also be a virtuous person at doing things really well. And that's the origin of the virtuoso concept, someone who plays the piano really well. So, um, I'm sure you've seen those people who play the piano. I don't know if any of you do, but I'm always amazed when I see someone who plays the piano really well to sit by a piano and start playing, and it feels like they were born knowing how to play the piano. It just comes out naturally. And then when you try to play the piano and nothing comes out of it, and you see how difficult it is, how hard it is. Well, that feeling of something coming out naturally, spontaneously, without effort, is the result of a lot of hard work, repetition, discipline. We have the same concept, surprisingly, in ancient China, even before Aristotle. 
the 6th century BCE with Confucius. Wu Wei is how they expressed it, okay? Wu Wei. And what Wu Wei means is, how it translates in English is, effortless action. Effortless action. Guess what? It refers to the same kind of effortless action that we see when someone plays the piano. It just comes, without, it comes out without effort. It just, you don't need to make any special effort. It just comes out naturally, spontaneously. Wu Wei and Aristotelian virtue are very similar concepts. Okay? Now, not so in the case of Christianity. In Christianity, the notion of virtue is one of an all or nothing. Jesus tells a, a would-be disciple, a, a rich young man who wanted to follow him, uh, he instructs him to to sell everything he has, give it to the poor, and follow him. He says, sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and follow me, he says. Sell everything you have, give it all to the poor. From an Aristotelian point of view, that's nonsense. That's excess. That's not virtue, that's excess. It's an all or nothing. He says, sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and you have a treasure in heaven. What is Aristotelian virtue from the Christian viewpoint? Lukewarm virtue at best, not real virtue. We give a little bit to the poor, that's not really, you know. So, um, two different concepts of virtue. As a matter of fact, both concepts really work hand in hand in real life. On the one hand, um, the Christian institutions maintain this, this all or nothing concept of virtue. So if someone is to give up their life for Jesus, like deny Jesus, no, I refuse, boom, then we shoot you and we'll kill you when that person is acknowledged to be a saint through that single act of virtue. Okay? On the other hand, no one is really such a hero in, in, in actual life, so people struggle through this more Aristotelian process of defining themselves as being virtuous through little, little actions day to day in, in, in our day to day life, okay? Okay, um, let me now um, explain the connection, the relationship between ethics and aesthetics, that's goodness and beauty in ethics. Um, and um, again, I'm going to draw this distinction between the the Greek concept and the Judeo-Christian concept of this understanding of how, how this is understood to be, this connection between uh, beauty and goodness. And in this case, it is also very different. <clears throat> in the Platonic, in this case, we're talking about Plato. In the Platonic concept, in the Platonic view of things, beauty and goodness go hand in hand. Beauty, physical beauty in this world, is a reflection of this true beauty that is found beyond the clouds in the other world, this divine beauty. The more beautiful you are, the closer you are to the gods, which is to say the better person you are, the better, morally speaking, the better you are. Okay? In Christian thought, and in Neoplatonic thought, now Plato was living in the 4th and 5th century BC. Neoplatonism flourishes 500 years later in the 3rd century of the Christian era, okay, in the 200s. So we're, it's called Neoplatonism, but it really takes place a long time after Plato. And it, it's not exactly the same as Platonism. So in Neoplatonic thought and in Christian thought, not so. Your physical beauty here is not a reflection from divine beauty. If anything, it may be a distraction from divine beauty. Um, and that is exemplified in the Christian myth of Lucifer. Who was Lucifer? The most beautiful angel, right? The angel of light. And it's precisely that beauty that appeared to have made him arrogant and to have rebelled against God in, in this 